But it is great to know the Lord, and I do love Jesus. And I've been trying the best I can to love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the other part of that, of course, is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So God bless you today. We welcome the guests that are here. Thank you for coming to Southland Tabernacle today. And there are folks here that have been coming the last few weeks. And maybe for some, a few months now they've been coming. And we're so happy that you're here. And I appreciate all of the folks that are in the house of the Lord today. It is with joy that I turn your attention to the word of the Lord. And if you would stand for the reading of God's word, this is in honor of the word of God, which pastor taught us Wednesday night is the perfect gift. The perfect gift. <clears throat> reading a very familiar selection of scripture for those of you that are acquainted with your Bibles. Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse number 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed." Do you realize you and your family have been blessed because of that promise from God? I love this in verse 15. And behold, I am with thee. For God to say that to you folks, that's pretty special. Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. It's better, folks, if the Lord's in the place and you recognize that he's in the place. Verse 17, our last verse, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Feel to minister to you for the next few minutes on the subject, divine encounters. Divine encounters. Would you stretch a hand up toward heaven and ask God to help help? bishop here today and ask God to speak to people here today and ask God to speak to you today. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're asking you to have your way here today. We need you today. I'm asking you to use me as a vessel, Lord, as an ambassador, as a messenger. And I'm asking you to speak to people here today. Open up hearts, open up minds, move in the soul of people today. <clears throat> in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, <clears throat> in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Turn around and shake hands with somebody and say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <clears throat>
You may be seated. Divine encounters. I feel impressed today to talk to us for the next few minutes on the extent to which God will go in an effort to reach people. I don't think any of us have ever comprehended how much God loves people. Bible says, for God so loved the world, so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God not only loves the masses of humanity, but he loves individual people. And I'm here to tell you today, and I hope the Holy Spirit will help me tell you, that God will stretch. He will stretch a long way. God will be patient for a long time. He will, he will reach out with his love. There is no limit to the extent that God will go to reach a soul for somebody to be saved. Those of us that sit here today, born again of the water and the spirit, on our way to heaven, it is because of God's encountering us. It's because of a divine encounter in our life. Come on, somebody. And no doubt there are folks here today that are not ready to go to heaven. I would especially like to appeal to you today to tell you there's a God in heaven that loves you and he will stretch, he will reach, he will love, he will work. He'll do everything that's in his power to try to get your attention and to turn you in his direction. Divine encounters. Our scripture text reveals the very special and unique encounter that the patriarch Jacob had with Almighty God. This holy encounter is initially introduced to us in verse 11. It says it like this. And he, Jacob, lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night. He lighted upon a certain place. A first reading of this Bible verse may lead the reader to think that the location that Jacob chose to spend the night was nothing more than a random choice. He lighted upon a place and he tarried there all night. The old English word lighted can easily be interpreted as a casual choice. Jacob was traveling. It was late, the sun was setting. The shadows of dusk were creeping toward nightfall. So Jacob looked around and said to himself, I'll just spend the night here. Mm -hmm. However, the English word lighted is translated from the Hebrew word pogah. I hope they have that on the screen. I sent those notes through, but I... I don't see them on the screen. Okay, we'll, we'll just go on. Paga, paga. The Hebrew word paga does not convey the idea of a random occurrence. Paga can also be properly translated encountered. Encountered. The term encountered implies the meeting, get this, of two objects moving toward one another. What might have appeared to Jacob as a casual choice was not just a casual choice. There was a God in heaven that was moving in the direction of Jacob. And Jacob, though he didn't know it, was moving in God's direction. Come on, somebody. Is anybody here happy the day you encountered the Lord Jesus Christ? May I pause here for just a moment to remind all of us that there is nothing that God does 
that is just random. I'm going to say that again. There is nothing that God does that is just random. Everything that God does is designed on purpose and with purpose. He's not a random God. He's not a God that's just happen chance. Hallelujah. He's the rock of ages. Come on, somebody. I said he's the rock of ages. He's a God who acts with purpose, designed with purpose, works on purpose, moves on purpose. So I rise today to declare to you that God's work in your life is never random. Never random. You see, God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. The Lord told the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 in verse 5, he said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Woo. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Jeremiah, my hand was on your life before you were even born. I stand to tell this audience, there's not a one of you here, but what when before you were born, the hand of God was upon your life. He's not a random God. He's not a happen chance God. Before you were even born, his hand was on your life. And he said, Jeremiah, I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. It's not only a truth regarding Jeremiah that the Lord's hand was upon him, but it's a truth regarding you. That the Lord was there when the first spark of your life was ignited in your mother's womb. When the very first spark of your life was ignited in your mother's womb, God was there. Furthermore, I believe the Lord was in attendance at the time of your birth. He was there. He was there in the hospital or in your family room or wherever you happen to be born. Sometimes people end up being born in a car. Doesn't matter. God's everywhere. Come on, somebody. Wherever you were born, I want to tell you God was there. I believe that. I believe he was there when I came forth from my mother's womb. Come on, somebody. God cares more about you than you even care about yourself. God's love is greater than a mother's love. God's love is greater than a father's love. God's love is greater than a husband's love. Greater than a wife's love. There's no love like the love of God. Jesus gave us another insight into the truth that God Almighty has no casual or random interactions with us. Luke chapter 12, verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. How many sparrows in the world do you think? And your Bible says he doesn't forget one of them. You compare this reading in Luke 12 to the reading in Matthew 10 where Jesus spoke about the same subject. In Matthew 10, he said, two sparrows are sold for one farthing. Hello? You get to Luke and Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Sparrows are so inexpensive that if you buy four, they give you one free. Hello? But not even the free one 
Jesus said, falls to the ground. But watch your heavenly father notices it. Then he said in, to us that don't you understand that you're worth more than many sparrows. All the sparrows in the world do not add up to the value of you, my friend. You and your soul are more valuable to God than all the birds in the universe. Come on, somebody. And if God sees even a sparrow that falls to the ground, there's not anything that happens in your life that is by chance or that is a random. Everything God does. Verse 7 of Luke 12. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now for some folks, that's an easier task for God than it is for others. <laughs> you combed your hair this morning and three hairs came out with the brush. You didn't know how many hairs you had before you started brushing your hair. And when you cleaned up the three that came out, when you were brushing your hair, you didn't know how many were left. But God in heaven knows at this very moment how many hairs are on your head. Come on, somebody. Don't tell me God doesn't care. Don't tell me that he's standing off somewhere uh, impassionate about what's going on in your world. That's not so. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you more than you even love yourself. So let me declare this truth to you this morning. All things that Jesus does or permits to happen in your life have a purpose. The Lord God never acts or reacts in an individual's life randomly. His purpose in your life, get this, is always ultimately working for your good. Amen. I want to tell you something, folks. Sometimes the devil get on your shoulder and say, you know what? The Lord's, the Lord's against me. He's trying to destroy me. If he wanted to destroy you, you'd already be destroyed. You wouldn't even be here this morning. Come on, somebody. We're here because of his mercy. We're here because of his love. We're here not because we deserved it. We don't even deserve to be here. But he loved us. He's merciful. He's gracious. And your life takes on a whole new hue, a whole new ambience. When you realize that anything that God does in my life or anything that he permits in my life is for my ultimate good. Now, we all know, we all know that everything that happens in our life is not always good. There are things that happen sometimes that are not good. The Bible didn't say everything that happens to you will be good. Hello? Sometimes there's bad stuff that happens. But if you're connected with God, he knows how to take the evil and turn it around for good. He knows how to take disaster and bring a miracle out of it. Come on, we serve a mighty God today. We don't serve a weakling. We don't serve a coward. We don't serve a God that's on the run. We serve a God that's in charge. We serve a God that has all power. Hallelujah. So not everything that happens in our life is good. Even when addressing the devoted believers in Romans 8, 28, the apostle Paul was careful not to say that all things that happen in a believer's life are good. He didn't say that. Notice his statement of faith carefully. Romans 8, 28. And we know that some things, most things, y'all aren't with me yet. 
Let's try it again. We know that some things, most things, 99% of things. Are you getting the message yet? Once in a while things. We know that somebody shouted. All things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. What happened may not be good, but God's going to make sure that it works together for the good. Sometimes it takes chastisement or adversity to help us develop the maturity and the purity that the good Lord wants us to possess. The Lord has allowed me to go through some things in my life and every believer here could give this testimony. And at the time it was painful. At the time I did not like it. I've even on occasion sobbed to the Lord and said, Lord, why me? Now, most of you don't want to admit that because you're looking really sharp this morning and looking good. You don't want to admit that you ever felt like, why me? But I can honestly say, I can honestly say, when I look back to some of those most painful experiences, they helped to shape me for the good. They helped to change me for the good. Come on, somebody. They helped to mature me. So sometimes the Lord allows adversity or chastisement. The Bible says when you're chastised from the Lord, don't resent it. Do not resent, do not hate the chastisement of the Lord. The Lord knows how to give you a spanking. Hello. He knows how to give you a spanking. He knows how to speak a language you understand. <laughs> your mama may not be able to get through to you. Your daddy may not be able to get through to you, but God knows how to get, speak a language you will understand. Is anybody understanding what I'm telling you right now? And sometimes he allows chastisement. You know, if you could only understand this, and if I could understand it, when we are being chastised by God, we know immediately what it's for. Now, this is the difference between the Lord and the devil. The devil will try to make you feel bad. You just get up and you feel bad. You feel negative. You feel sluggish. You feel something's wrong. So you kind of think, and what is this? I, did I do something yesterday I shouldn't have done? Uh, no, I, I didn't, rob, didn't rob Huntington Bank. I didn't do that. No. <laughs> Brother Jason's back there waving his hand saying, thank you. <laughs> but the devil will try to make you miserable and not tell you why. Hello? That's one reason why you can recognize it's a devil. Because if it's chastisement and God's upset with you about something and he's correcting you, you'll immediately know because God puts his finger right on what it is. This is why. This is why you feel this way. This is why you're going through this. You got to get this corrected. Come on, somebody. You got to get this corrected in your life. So don't view conviction, don't view chastisement as an enemy. It's not an enemy. It's a friend. Conviction is a friend. Chastisement is a friend. I've actually prayed before and said, Lord, I don't like this, but I know why. And I want to thank you for it because I needed it. Hello. Never forget this maxim. God is always more concerned about our character than he is about our comfort. God is more concerned about my character than he is my comfort. He's more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. For the unsaved, or for those who are Ephraims or prodigals, there are times when the Lord will allow disaster to strike. 
Most often, the punish, the judgment is not meant to destroy the individual. Rather, it is meant to get their attention and to prompt them to make. Folks, I'm just telling you, this is the way it is. God allows things to happen to prodigals, to backsliders, to Ephraims, people that know better, but they're not living right. He allows things to happen, not because he wants to destroy them, because if he wanted to do that, he could do it faster than you can snap your fingers. But he does it to get our attention. And he does it to prompt us to make the needed changes in our lives, to humble ourselves before God, repent. Oh God, have mercy on me. I don't want to be lost. I want to be saved. You see, the good Lord understands that recovering from a severe vehicle accident that puts you in the hospital for weeks, but then you turning to God and repenting and getting right with God, all of that's far better than ending up in the lake of fire. Could I tell you today, cancer is not the worst thing that could happen to you. A house burning down is not the worst thing that can happen to you. A severe traffic accident is not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to any of us is for us to end up being eternally lost and cast into the lake of fire. Jesus said it's better to go to heaven with one eye than to have two eyes and go into hell. Better to go to heaven with one hand than having two hands and end up in hell. Better to go to heaven with one leg than end up in hell with both legs. Talking about divine encounters. Now there is a most interesting fact regarding our scripture text. At the time of Jacob's encounter with God, Jacob, get this, was actually running away from the promised land. Jacob was running away from the land that was gifted by God with a covenant promise. He was headed in the opposite direction. Notwithstanding, you got to get this. Remember, encounter means two objects Moving toward one another. Two objects. God was using Jacob's unique circumstances to circle him around. And move Jacob ultimately more fully toward God and God's plan for his life. Jacob was on a journey that would end up with a U-turn. Hello? Now, pastor told us Wednesday, the way to be saved is to turn right and stay straight. If you don't stay straight, you need another move. You need a turnaround. Jacob, you don't know it. You think you're running away from the promised land, but I am involved in this and it's going to cause you to circle around and you will be back to the place that I wanted you to be. Come on, somebody. I'm talking to many folks here today, good people. You have now a walk with God, but you can look back in your history and time when you were running away from God. Aren't you glad he didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad he didn't just judge you and cut you off? But looking back, we can see where God was at work, even using sometimes negative situations in which we were participating to circle us around and head us back toward the Lord. Some of us, would have been destroyed had not God been working on our best interest. Could I just say for most of us that are here today that we may have one or two angels in the congregation. I'm talking about in the flesh. We may have one or two angels here, but for most of us, there's a time in our life God could have cut us off 
and been totally justified. I know you don't want to admit that right now, but it's the truth. <clears throat> but aren't you glad he didn't give up on you? He kept on reaching. He kept on stretching. He kept on working. He was causing you to circle around. In Genesis chapter 50, after Jacob died, the Bible tells us Joseph's brothers became extremely fearful. With dad gone, Joseph is probably going to punish us for all the nasty stuff we did to him, maybe even execute us, because they had perpetrated a lot of evil against Joseph. Notwithstanding, Joseph calmed their fears with this statement in Genesis 50, 17. But as for you, he said to his brothers, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. Woo! There's some things the devil has done in your life that he meant it for evil, but God has given you a turnaround. God has meant it for good. If the musicians would come, please. That's not only a signal to you, but that's a signal to the congregation that we're nearing the runway. Perhaps there's a sinner here today, a prodigal, or even a believer who is experiencing some great difficulties right now. Don't allow your present circumstances to cause you to hate God and to, to turn you against him. Please understand, as long as you are alive and breathing, I'm speaking to somebody, the Holy Ghost is speaking to somebody, as long as you are alive and breathing, and there, there is nothing that happens to you that is just by chance. God may be in, indeed attempting to circle you around, and turn you in his direction so that ultimately and eternally you will be saved. Could we all stand please? The apostle Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. Look at this. But is long suffering to us word, not willing, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our walk with God starts with repentance according to the second chapter of Acts on the day of Pentecost when the apostle was preaching. As he preached, verse 37 says, now when they heard this, the audience, the crowd, some have estimated that there was perhaps as many as 50,000 people that gathered at this event of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We know that it was quite a few because there were 5,000 that ended up being baptized and receiving the Holy Ghost. But it says now when they heard this, they were pricked or cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We're guilty, we're sinners, what do we do? Acts 2.38, I love this. I added three numbers in there to make it real easy for you to understand. There's three things you gotta do. Then Peter said unto them, would you say the first one with me? Repent, that's number one. It's when you confess your sins to God. You tell him, I don't wanna live this way anymore. Please change me, Lord. And number two, let's say it together. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You repent, number one. Number two, you let the preacher baptize you. And number three, let's say it together. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It takes you, the preacher, and God to get you ready for heaven. You repent. 
the preacher baptizes you, God fills you with the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. I believe the Lord is calling for people here today. The Lord is reaching for people here today. Believe it or not, folks, the Lord in this service, the Holy Spirit is stretching, stretching for people today. God doesn't want you to be lost. He wants you to be saved. I'm going to ask everybody that will right now move into this altar. We're getting ready to sing. We're getting ready to pray. And this is a wonderful time for you to connect with God. If you are not right with God today, you can get right before you leave here today. Everybody that will, would you gather in? Let's come and let's seek the Lord.